Um, and the presentation today is Transforming Parent-Child Interaction and Family Routines, a Longitudinal Single Subject Sequential and Multivariate Analysis with 10 Families. And these are families of children with developmental disabilities and severe problem behavior, in some cases extreme problem behavior. This research was conducted over seven years and uh, there were quite a number of people involved and I just wanted to briefly introduce the research team included uh, uh, my project co coordinator Sophia Khan, three interventionists, um, a, a clinical supervisor, a counseling psychologist. Some, I also did a, we had a consortium site in New Jersey. They worked with uh, uh, three families there. One family left, so they end up working with two families there. And then I had a couple of consultants from Oregon. And the study was funded by the National Institutes of Health, specifically the National Institute of Child Health and Human Development uh, from the United States. It's a public health service grant, also called an R01. So what you'll be seeing is a seven-year study of an ecological family-centered positive behavior support approach with parents of children with developmental disabilities and severe problem behavior. Basically a study of uh, positive behavior support done with families. Um, this study asked a theoretical question. Uh, within a positive behavior support approach, to what extent does a broader ecological unit of analysis contri contribute to meaningful, durable, and sustainable improvements in child behavior and participation in family life. The idea here is the field of behavior analysis and behavior intervention is about 40, 50 years long with people. However, within this science of behavior change, the, the one challenge we continue to face is how do you build sustainable change? How do you build durable improvements in child behavior? Because studies usually stop after a month or two of intervention. Um, so that we don't really know whether the interventions we do endure the test of time. Most studies don't collect long-term follow-up, follow like over six months or a year. And so this study was focused on how can we design a unit of analysis intervention that will promote meaningful, durable, and sustainable change. We proposed an ecological unit of analysis, which we call parent-child interaction and family routines. And this unit of analysis has three levels of family ecology. Because I recognize there's a number of people who are quite new to this area, I may provide a little bit more explanation than I usually do. One of the things we've learned in the field of behavior change, there's a science of behavior change called applied behavior analysis, is that a child's problem behavior serves a function. Like if you have a brother or sister who's pulled your hair, right? He probably had a purpose, a reason for doing it. Um, and so the first level of ecology is the child's problem behavior and its purpose. Why is a child doing it? And children with disability usually engage in problem behavior to get attention or to escape a demand or to get something they want, like an item or a preferred activity. And in, in addition to that, the next level of family ecology is the interaction between the parent and child. And a famous psychologist in um, Oregon named Jerry Patterson has taught us that when parent and children are interacting in a way that leads to child problem behavior, there's actually a reciprocal process going on between the parent and child. Uh, the parent is reinforcing the child's problem behavior, but also the child is reinforcing the parent's behavior as well. So for example, if a child's engaging in problem behavior to get, to get attention, when the parent delivers that attention, that reinforces that problem behavior. The, that means the child is more likely to engage in problem behavior to get attention again. But when that parent delivers that attention, right, then what often happens is the child settles down. Like if you ever recall your brother teasing you when they succeeded in getting your goat, they probably just looked at you and smiled. They stopped doing what, what, what it was that was teasing because they got what they wanted. They got the attention. So the child settles down, and that's rewarding to the parent, right? The, child, the parent would prefer the child not to be engaging in the problem. 
So when they deliver the attention, the child settles down, that reinforces the parent for doing something ineffective, which is delivering attention contingent on problem behavior. So that's just one example of a, what's called a course of process, and that's what Jerry Patterson called it. When the, parenting, when the child engages in problem behavior, that courses the, the parent to submit to them, and then after the parent submits, the child settles down, that's a course of process. So that's what Jerry Patterson discovered. What we're interested in also is, okay, if there's a coercive pattern of parent-child interaction, there has to be a reciprocal or, a, or a, a mirroring constructive process. So we're really interested in what, what do the constructive processes look like? Can we turn coercive processes of interaction into constructive processes? So that's the second level of ecology. First we have the purpose of the child behavior, and then we have the pattern of interaction between the parent and child. That's the second level. So the third level of ecology is called the activity setting, also known as the family routine, or, or the family routines of, of daily life. Now, this comes out of the field of cross-cultural anthropology. Cross-cultural anthropologists have learned by studying cultures across the world that in terms of child development, families strive to create what's called activity settings, a family life, in which a child can develop. That can be simple things like getting up in the morning, getting ready for school, um, having dinner together as a family, um, playing with one's brother or sister, um, going to bed at night, going out in the community, doing th things like going to stores or restaurants or visiting relatives. In those activity settings of family life, that's where child development occurs. And no matter where you are in the world, all activity settings have the same structure. Whether you're raising a child in Canada or whether you're raising a child in the middle of Africa, the morning routine has the same structure. There's people and tasks, you know, people in a place where it happens, there's resources that are used, there are tasks that get done, there are goals and values that are being worked on, and there's patterns of interaction, scripts of interaction that are probably culturally informed that are also occurring. Now the content is different. I don't know if you know, but in many African communities, the way a morning routine begins is the mother gets up at five o'clock in the morning before the sun rises and walks two miles to the river with a large clay jug, scoops water into it, walks back to her village, picks up a couple of cow pies on the way, which is fuel, um, starts a fire under a pot, puts some rice in, some water, and uses the cow pies to heat the water, and within another half hour raise, raises her children, rises, gets her children out of bed, and serves them rice. Um, well, what we do is we get up in the morning at six o'clock, go down to the, to the, to the, um, to the sink, uh, fill a pot with water, a little bit easier, right? And then we may put some oatmeal into it, right? And then after the oatmeal's ready, we ask our children to get up and have a nice healthy meal. But the structurally, it's exactly the same. It's just different by the, the, the resources those different communities have in the traditions that they follow. So what we've said is the combination of these, if we can weave these three levels of family ecology into a new uh, unit of analysis intervention, we might be able to get sustainable change. We might be able to get durable change because we're looking at the function of the child's behavior, the pattern of child interaction, in the context in which all this is happening the family activity setting. So that's the idea. That's the proposition. And the idea here is if we can do that, these are the outcomes we hope to get. Parent implementation fidelity. If you give them a behavior support plan, they're more likely to implement, implement it with fidelity. We're more like, we, we propose that we'll get durable improvements in child behavior. The parents will be able to use the strategies and they'll be able to sustain the use of the strategies beyond our presence because we, of course, an interventionist can't always be there. Um, and also, the parent will be able to adapt the use of these strategies across a child's life cycle as a child grows, as the routines change and adapt to the child's growth. So the mission of the project has been to empower families of children with developmental disabilities and problem behavior to transform course of parent-child interaction and problematic family routines into constructive parent-child interaction and successful family routines. 
And this cartoon, I think, pretty much characterizes the, the, the challenge that families face and what we have faced with families over the last 15 years of work. Uh, Calvin says, I thrive on change. And Hobbes doubtfully replies, you? You threw a fit this morning because your mom put less jelly on your toast than yesterday. I thrive on making other people change. And that's what children with disability do with their parents. They engage in problem behaviors in an effort to train the parents to conform to their expectations, to their more constricted view of what they should be doing or not doing. This is what an escape-driven course of process looks like. Uh, parent makes a request or demand. Child engages in problem behavior. The, the parent will either reduce or withdraw the demand, and right after that, the child will terminate or reduce the problem behavior. So when the parent reduces or withdraws the demand, that's a reinforcer for problem behavior, or else the problem behavior will continue to occur in the future. But when the ch child terminates or reduces the problem behavior after the parent submits, that will then reinforce the parent for submitting. So both parties are getting reinforced for things that aren't real healthy, problem behavior and ineffective parenting practices. And here's a nice example of it. I don't want to go to preschool. This is a, another course of process that's common. It's called attention-driven. The other one was escape-driven, based on a demand. This is where a parent's busy. N uh, no parent of any child can give them their undivided attention. Parents need to get things done around the house. You need to um, prepare breakfast, supper. One needs to you know, clean the house, wash the clothing. One needs to attend to the needs of other family members, right? One might even desire to have some free time and watch a little you know, TV or something or go into the internet. But what happens when the parent is busy and not attending to the child with disability is often these children get, will get engage in problem behavior for the purpose of getting attention. The parent then will deliver the attention. It could be negative attention. It could be positive attention to the child. It doesn't matter. It's better than no attention at all. And then once the child gets the attention, the child will settle down. They'll terminate the problem behavior. And so this is another reciprocal process of reinforcement where when the parent delivers the attention, that reinforces the attention getting problem behavior. When the child settles down after the parent submits by giving the attention, that reinforces the parent for submitting by giving attention. And once these, pro these cycles get started, they, they, they repeat themselves in the family's life. They can occur dozens of times a day, hundreds of times a week, thousands of times a year. And once this pattern gets established in the family of a child with disability, it's very, very difficult to change. It becomes very, very tenacious. The other thing about these, this is an example of Ethan asking for attention. Certainly, with that display, he will get it. So again, the central aim of this project has been whether we can actually promote transformational change by focusing on uh, parent-child interaction and family routines and addressing the function of the child <coughs> behavior in the routine. So my Webster dictionary from 1982, I confess I have a very old dictionary, is tra transforming the change in composition or structure implies a major change in form, nature, or function, or to change one thing into another. And so to change one thing, for example, a caterpillar into another, a butterfly, the notion of transformation is different than change. Because you, you, you don't say that, that a, a um, caterpillar changed into a butterfly. You say it transformed into a butterfly. The, the notion of transformation means once you get that change, it doesn't go back. So can we promote change in family-child interaction that is so, so um, deep that the likelihood of it going back is very, very small? Of course, for a butterfly, it's impossible. I, I'm not sure we can say that with us in behavior, but it would be nice to try. And Oliver Wendell Holmes puts it in human terms. This is a quote I really like. One, he, he was a famous um, Supreme Court justice in the turn of the century in the United States. One's mind, once stretched by a new idea, never returns to its original dimensions. So can we help families understand this so deeply and have their behavior change so thoroughly that once they grasp the meaning and the, and the change, they won't go back. They won't fall back into the course of trap. And thus, they'll be able to support their child and help their child grow. 
So can we transform escape-driven coercive processes into those, that's what we showed you, into constructive processes in routines in which parent demands are common? Again, just as I mentioned for uh, parents not being able to give children their undivided attention, across the day, a parent doing their job, doing their duty as a parent, is going to need to make requests and demands of their child, whether they have a disability or not. Get up, get ready for school, eat healthy foods, play nicely with your sister, play nicely with your toys, get ready for bed, brush your teeth, go to bed, go to sleep, stay in your own bed. I mean, these are all common requests we make of children as parents. Um, can, can we transform the interaction so that, that that will happen, that parents will be able to do that and they'll succeed? And also, can we, can we transform attention-driven course of processes into constructive processes in family routines in which parents are busy? Can children with disability learn to endure, tolerate less attention? Uh, manage their free time long enough that the parent can take a breath, get things done around the house, and take care of the needs of other family members, and not just a child with disability. So those are the essential aims of this study to help families do that. So the methods. Uh, there were two, 10 families participating, seven Caucasian, one family was from Iran, um, three Asian, one family from Taiwan, one family from mainland China, and one family from Japan. Uh, the, the children had developmental disabilities. Uh, eight of the 10 children had a diagnosis of autism. Uh, several of the children in addition, had an intellectual disability. One of the children with a, when I say autism, I mean auti autism spectrum disorder. One of those children had Asperger syndrome, and he had a, 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 an IQ of 140. So this is a very, 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 did I already say very? Very, very high functioning child, but with autism and some pretty significant problem behavior. When the study began in 2004, the children were three and eight years old. And of course, they're a bit older now. Problem behaviors in the home and community included defiance, screaming, aggression, disruptive behavior, and destructive behavior. Some of the more extreme behaviors included uh, operant vomiting and, and uh, feces smearing at 3 o'clock in the morning. It wasn't fun. That wasn't fun. So the settings were valued but unsuccessful routines in the home and community. Uh, there were two categories, escape-driven routines, like a parent wanting to read to their child. Sit in my lap, sweetie, let's read the book, turn the page, look at the word, uh, look at the picture, touch the, touch the cat. A uh, restaurant routine where the parent is actually going to a restaurant happened to be White Spot. We love White Spot. They were very kind to us, very supportive of the research. Uh, you know, come, sit down, wait, um, eat the food served, stay in your seat. Those are escape-driven, where the demands are common. And attention-driven routines, such as the parent is preparing supper and the child has free time, either alone or with a sibling. And they're supposed to play independently or cooperatively where the parent is busy preparing supper. Or bedtime, the child is preparing to go to bed and when the, the parent is, all, is able to leave the room, the child falls asleep in their own bed without the parent having to be there. That was the aim, uh, though that was part of the family's vision. So th those are attention-driven routines. So the dependent variables were child problem behavior, routine steps completed by the child. Now this is an interesting measure. It's called the conditional probability of a course of process and a conditional probability of constructive process. So we, we actually coded ch parent-child interaction in real time. And we asked this question, this statistical question. Given that the parent made a demand in baseline, meaning before we helped, what's the conditional probability that the child engaged in a problem behavior. Or given that the child made it, given that the parent made a demand and the child engaged in problem behavior, what's the conditional probability that the parent withdrew the demand and then the child settled down? That would be the full four steps of the course of process. So we're actually able to measure that uh, mathematically using this, this um, a certain software program that allows us to do that. We also wanted to know, okay, we have our our conditional probability data for baseline. We have our conditional probability data for intervention. Was there a statistically significant change 
in course of process from baseline intervention? Was there a statistically significant change in constructive process from baseline intervention? And the units of measurement used were were joint frequency and what's called Yule's Q. And very briefly, joint frequency is how many times did that interaction occur between the parent and child? It's joint because it's parent behavior and child behavior. It's like how many times did uh, the parent give it to the man and the child engage in problem behavior? That's a joint frequency. A Yule's Q is like a correlation coefficient. What's the correlation between a parent demand and child problem behavior? That's, a, that's called a Yule's Q. And those are the statistics that we compared um, in our analysis. We also looked at family functioning. We want to know if we can change, if we change parent-child interaction and valued family routines in a way that we, we think is, is good and positive, will that affect parenting stress? Will that affect parenting quality of life? Will that affect a parent's sense of control there's, there's, there's this measure called parent locus of control. How much does a parent feel like they have control over the rearing of their child? And the scale goes from, you know, I, I have no control, the child's in complete control, or f- chance and fate is in complete control, versus I am control. I do, the, the fate of my child is in my hands, I can raise a child in a way that I, I, I hope and, and wish for. So that, that's the scale that that looks at. And also sociability. How acceptable was this uh, process to families? The independent variable is the, for those who haven't been exposed to the scientific method for a while, an independent variable is your intervention. The dependent variable is what you're measuring to see if you affected that, right? So this is the independent variable, a family-centered PBS approach. So the first thing we do from the get-go, and we continue this all through the intervention process, is we build and maintain collaborative partnerships. We, we want to do this as partners with the family. We, we, we essentially don't want to follow what's called an expert model, where we simply tell the parent what to do and expect the family to comply. We do an cl- assessment collaboratively. We build a plan collaboratively. We, we implement the plan as partners. And all through the process, we, we, we listen to the family and take their concerns to heart and try and improve the plan based on their input. We conduct a comprehensive assessment, which includes a, what's called a family ecology assessment and a functional assessment. A functional assessment allows you to understand the purpose of the child's problem behavior. The family ecology assessment allows you to understand the family routines and also the routines that are important to the family for changing, and also a little bit about the family ecology so that you can make a plan that's a good fit for the family. And then based on that information, we design a behavior support plan. We focus on improving valued family routines, as I've mentioned, such as getting up in the morning, um, having a meal together as a family, like dinner, for example, um, going to bed at night, uh, going to a restaurant, going to a grocery store. One parent wanted to work on going to church uh, or going for a walk in the community. The plans are multi-component because what we know is one intervention, one strategy is not enough. You need a plan with multi-components to have a chance for having a meaningful and durable effect. We also want our plans to be technically sound, which means they're consistent with the laws of behavior and also contextually appropriate. The plans are a good fit with the family, with their life, with their values, with their goals, with their resources. And then based on this, based on this, all of this information, we also identify family-centered supports that may be necessary to help the family implement the plan. For example, if a family is exhausted from chronic caregiving, it's unlikely that they'll be successful at implementing a multi-component positive behavior support plan, no matter how well it's designed. So in that case, we'll try and work with the family to find resources for respite care so that the family can get some rest and catch their breath. If, for example, the parent and the mother and father are having a conflict, there's a lot of uh, 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 marital conflict in the family, we know that also will make it very difficult for the plan to be implemented with fidelity or maintained over time. So in that case, we'll counsel the family to participate in marital therapy or counseling at some level. And we have a counseling, we, ha- we, we had a counseling psychologist 
as a member of our team. And so that counseling psychologist would either provide such a psychological service or supervise us as we provide some form of that service. Then we provide, once we have a plan that the family says, yes, this is a good plan, we're willing to do this, it's a good fit for our family, we provide initial training and support. And that includes going to the home in those routines and modeling the use of the strategies, coaching the family in their use of the strategies, having meetings afterward or before where we rehearse or role play the use of the strategies. We also give the parent a, a one or two page checklist, which is a bulleted list of the strategies as a way of helping them remember what to do. It's called a self-monitoring checklist. And we also pr support the family in the, using those family-centered supports, whether that's ensuring that they are getting respite care or ensuring that there is some marital counseling occurring in, 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 in regard to marital conflict. And there's a, a wide variety of other family centers supports we've, we provided to family. Two mothers had a, a, a serious issue with attentiveness. They had a difficult time being present. They were always somewhere else in their head and that made it impossible for them to implement strategies with any fidelity at all. They couldn't remember what to do. Um, and that was a durable issue. So we asked the family's permission to bring up the notion of mindfulness training and two families who had this problem agreed to participate in mindfulness training. And so I, I have a, a mindfulness practice that I've been doing for about 35 years. I reveal my age. Um, and so both families consented to participate in a mindfulness practice and that really helped. They learned, they were more capable of being attentive, present in the moment in a way that was allowed them to implement behavior support strategies with fidelity in a way they weren't able to before. Um, then once the change in the routine occurs, in, in, er, in almost every case the family succeeded in improving child behavior in the target routines we looked at, we then said, okay, now we're going to provide you with maintenance support. We're not going to come very often, but once in a while we're going to touch base with you on this routine to make sure that you can maintain the change that you've succeeded in creating. And to help with that, we do what's called relapse pre prevention training. And what that involves is we sit down with the parent before we go into maintenance support, we say, okay, what are the common obstacles that have gotten in the way or could get in the way of your continued ability to implement these strategies and for your child to continue to behave as well as he now does behave in these routines? For example, a parent will say, um, well, twice a year I have to work full time. That really reduces my, uh, my availability to my child and that really sets us in a, on a negative path. And so if we can have a plan for that, then I can keep this going throughout the year or um, my child gets sick, and when they get sick, things tend to go south when we try to get back to the plan. Or when I get ill, it's really hard for me to maintain fidelity. So for each of those potential obstacles, we say, okay, what can we do to ensure that that doesn't actually stop you? Allow, so we have strategies for working through or around those obstacles so they can, the family can continue to succeed. We also provide the parent with a very simple three-question checklist it's, um, to, to self-evaluate whether the course of process has returned. So it's individualized to each family. For example, uh, one parent who tended to always give negative attention for problem behavior, the question is, did your child engage in problem behavior this week? If the answer is yes, then you go to the next question. When they did engage in problem behavior, did you do one of the following? Shout at them, <laughs> uh, walk up to them and tell them why they shouldn't do it, like try to reason with them after problem behavior. Um, and a, a whole list of things that that parent would typically do that would reinforce the problem. And if the answer is yes, you did that, the third question is, when you did that, when you basically gave negative or positive attention to your child, did the child settle down? And if the answer to the third question is yes too, thus the answer to all three questions is yes, 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 that alerts the parent that they've fallen back into what's called the reinforcement trap. And now they've got to pull themselves out, which means go back to the plan, start to re-implement the strategies, remind yourself what to do, and if you can't do it on your own, just give us a call and we'll help you. And that did happen a few times, and so the, the checklist proved to be helpful in helping parents get back on track. And also, we work on, <clears throat> in maintenance support, we begin to teach the parent how to understand new problems in this way and solve their own problems. So we actually teach them how to do 
what we are trained to do, which is do a, a functional assessment, and based on that assessment, build a support plan. And they already have a foundation for that because they have a plan, right? So really it's a matter of taking from the plan they have and adapting it to new problems. We're also family-centered, uh, and this is important to say too because this is the overwrapping uh, philosophy of our approach. We, we have a family orientation. We serve the whole family, not just the child. There, there's a positiveness to the approach where we think the best about the parents without passing judgment. We don't judge what parents do or don't do. We simply just say, okay, how, what's the effect of that on the child? If it's salutary, if it's positive, great. If it's not, well, let's look at that and see what we can do that might be more positive, more salutary, more helpful to you. Uh, sensitivity, uh, we, we strive to demonstrate an understanding of the family's concerns, needs, and priorities from their point of view, not from our point of view. Uh, we're re Responsiveness is another quality of being family-centered, which boils down to a, a, a common quote in this area of family-centered practice, doing whatever needs to be done, including being at the family's home at 3 o'clock in the morning, if that's when they need help, and they can't do it on, by, by themselves at 3 o'clock in the morning. Friendliness, developing a reciprocal relationship, offering practical help in conveying caring to both parents and child not just to the child, and also de developing child and community skills, uh, continuing to work on our own knowledge about child development and methods of teaching so that we can continue to be better at it in terms of teaching the child, supporting the fa family, and also being eager to establish collaborative partnerships with those su super service providers who are willing to work with us. We, we work with occupational therapists, speech and language therapists, we worked with uh, school personnel, all of those willing to work with us, we collaborated with during the process of supporting the 10 families. Now, here's what the behaviors plan looked like it, generically. The plans were individualized across the 10 families, but these were common components of most plans. The first thing is, in whatever routine there is, we would embed natural reinforcers. That's a common technique. So if it's a dinner routine, you want to embed food that the child um, prefers. If you're in a restaurant, you know there's a long wait, bring some toys that the child loves to play with that'll occupy their time until the food is served. In a going to bed routine, make sure there's stuffies on the bed that are really comforting. There's soothing music that the child loves to listen to and might actually help the child calm down and get ready for his bed. If, if you're gonna do a reading routine, make sure the content is something the child is really interested in. For example, one child was really into Tommy the Train books or Tommy the Train in general, so we, we use Tommy the Train books. Um, we also use visual supports to increase predictability in the prompt desire, basically a visual schedule, the child can see what's happening, because children with autism, for example, you, if you say something, and they don't remember what you say, their verbal memory skills aren't well developed, but if you show them a picture of what's going to happen, they remember, because their visual system of memory works quite well. So we would use visual supports to help the chil children be able to predict what's going to happen next. We offer the children choices in situations there where there were demands, but there could be choices within those demands. Because one, one, one of the things research has shown is if you offer choices to children with disability, they're much more likely to be cooperative. That's probably true for all of us as well, right? Also, we use positive Use po we taught the family to use positive contingencies to motivate, motivate positive behavior. That's simply uh, another way of saying grandma's rule. First do something that you don't quite want to do and then you'll get or do something you want to do. For example, at the dinner table, um, let's eat these foods and then we'll have dessert. Um, let's, let's get ready for bed and then I'll read a story to you because reading a story is a, is a reward. And that will now r motivate the child to get ready for bed or to eat the non-preferred foods because they know something good will happen after. Ha Does that, anyone remember their parents doing that with them? It's called grandma's rule or your grandmother. We also use safety signals to build endurance. Like some children have a hard time waiting to get attention or they can't endure the task. They're getting a little antsy about the task. If you keep on pressing them to continue, they'll start to engage in problem behavior. A safety signal essentially saying, 
we're going to do a little bit more of what's hard for you and then you'll be safe. Then you'll get what you want, which is like a break or the attention you want. For example, if the parent's busy in the kitchen and the kid's seeming a little antsy in the living room, you say, um, uh, buddy, I'll be there in a minute. Hang tough and I'll be there in a minute. That's a safety signal. It means hang, you know, play nicely for another minute and I'll come out and play. I'll, I'll support you. I'll help you as you may need help. Or in a situation where you're doing work. Okay, we're doing homework. The child's getting antsy. If you, if you continue to press the child to do homework, they might have a problem behavior. You say, oh, it looks like you're getting tired. Let's, t let's do one more and take a break. And the child will then go, okay, I can do one more and take a break. I can handle that. That's called a safety signal. We also use errorless teaching methods, and we taught parents to use errorless teaching me methods. That's where you know how the child's going to behave in the routine in terms of completing the tasks, and you provide just enough support so the child succeeds with every task. And over time, you gradually fade that support. That's called errorless teaching. We also t taught functional communication skills, like the child learning to request a break instead of using problem behavior to get a break, re requesting help or attention instead of using problem behavior to get help or attention. That could be as sim simple as saying, um, I need help, or break, or picking up a break card and handing it to you if the child's nonverbal. So the children learn to do that instead of use problem behavior to get their want or need met. We also taught the parents to reward desired behavior with praise, with um, preferred items, preferred activities. That's a very important part of a good behavior support plan. The parents also learn to honor the child's use of language to get a want or need, make, a want or need met. So for example, if the child did say break or I need help, the parent would immediately provide a break or provide help. Because that's the way the child learns that it works. If a child says, I need help, and you don't respond, they'll stop using language. They'll go back to using problem behavior. So the parents learn to be responsive to the child's appropriate requests to meet their wants or need. Now, if the child engaged in minor problem behavior, the parent learned to actively ignore the behavior, which means don't act like you notice the behavior, don't bring attention to the behavior, but simply redirect the child to something appropriate that within the routine. Like if the child begins to um, act silly at the dinner table, you say, sweetheart, take your fork and, and eat some broccoli. Or take your fork, or, or pick, up some, pick up a chip and eat a chip. So instead of, of course, if the child's using their fork to eat the broccoli, or picking up the chip with their hand to eat a chip, that's incompatible with silly talk, right? So now the parent has successfully redirected the child back to the meal routine, and the appropriate behaviors of a meal routine redirected them away from silly talk. And finally, if significant behavior occurs, the child really does engage in moderate to high intensity problem behavior, like hitting, screaming, um, uh, verbal aggression, like swearing or threatening a parent, uh, you, then this is the tough love part. Every, all those other strategies are pretty um, considerate, positive, uh, encouraging. This is where you ba basically have to teach the child that doesn't work. And so you, you ensure that the major problem behaviors do not achieve their purpose. And that doesn't necessarily mean this um, colloquial term punishment. The aim is not to punish the child, but to communicate to the child that what you j did will not get what you want. So in an escape-driven routine, it simply means the parent will probably maintain the demand, not back off. In attention-driven routines, it means the parent will not deliver more attention contingent on that problem behavior. And in routines where the child wants an item or an activity, and they're engaging in all kinds of escalating behavior to get that item, you simply don't give the item. So as long as you don't reward the behavior, the behavior will weaken over time. That's the idea, and that's what happens. So that, those are the essential components of a behavior support plan. Quickly on research designs, we had a group design across 10 families. We had a single subject research design with each family. Uh, how many have heard of single subject research? How many have heard of group design research? So a multiple baseline design is basically you do an experiment with one participant. And you actually use a research design that's, ex that's experimental with one participant. A group design means you put all these 10 families together and you look at an, a group average. And you're looking whether the group averages are different from baseline to intervention. Everybody know what a baseline is? It means before you intervene. 
Intervention means now you're intervening. So before and after. Right? Is that clear? And we also do something called sequential analysis where we look at parent-child interaction and we want to know the conditional probabilities of a parent behavior, a child behavior after a parent behavior. That's called sequential analysis because it's a sequence of interaction, right? And we're analyzing that sequence. That's why it's called sequential analysis. And we want to see if we can transform course of processes and the constructor processes. So here are the results. A little overview. I'm going to show some group design results for problem behavior and routine steps completed. Some sequential analysis results across 10 families. And some group design results on family functioning. And, I'll have, and I have actually one case study to show you. We only have time for one case study today. So he, here it is in one fell swoop. Um, and I think this graph will be pretty clear to you in the meaning of it. Here's average percentage of intervals of problem behavior from zero percentage of intervals to 100%. That means in any given routine, the child could have zero problem behaviors or the routine could be just filled to the, to the, to the top with problem behavior. And this is average percent of steps completed. Okay, so there's two lines. And this is baseline. Number one is baseline. Two and three is intervention. And this is follow-up. Follow-up means we haven't supported the family for anywhere from six months to anywhere from three months to 24 months. Depending on the family, that varied. Uh, one family, we went up to six months follow-up. Another family went up to 24 fo months follow-up, meaning two years, no help. Just go in and observe, see if things maintained. And what you can see is, during baseline, the percentage of intervals of problem behavior across all the families, this is an average, is an average of about 52%. And after initial training, it dropped down to about 12%. And then after, during maintenance support, that's two sub-phases of intervention, initial training and maintenance support, which I described to you, it further dropped down to about 6% of intervals. And during follow-up, now there were only set, there were 10 families up to that point, but in follow-up we were only able to get to seven families. Three families weren't available to us. For those seven families, they pretty much stayed the same. Here, we measured it again for the seven families, just about the same, and that maintained. So essentially what this shows you is that those changes that occurred during the time of intervention maintained up to 24 months later in terms of a decrease in problem behavior. For steps completed, you see just the opposite um, but, but mirroring uh, outcome. Families were able to complete about 30% 30, 30 or so of steps uh, during baseline, which is a very low number of steps, right? They weren't able to succeed in the routine, but that shot up to about 80% during initial training, shot up to about 91% or 92% during maintenance support, and that maintained for the seven families we were able to get to uh, during follow-up up to 24 months later for some families. So that shows, and these results are statistically significant to what's called the .0005 level, which means the chance of this change occurring just by chance, you know, you know, the weather was good, or they just matured, and that's the reason why it occurred. The chance of this occurring by chance, not our intervention, is almost as close to zero as you can get. So that means that there was an effect. Does everybody see that? And this is a little bit complicated. And so I'm going to try and be brisk about it. But a coercive process has four steps. Is there, a, is there a marking pen? Oh, yeah, here. So here is a parent. Here is child. And here is step one, two, three, four. And the first step is a demand, for example. And then child problem behavior. And then the parent withdraw the demand, right? And then child terminate problem behavior. That's the fourth step. So it goes like this, like that, like this, okay? Everybody got that? 
So a course of process goes parent behavior, child behavior. Parent demand, you know, brush your teeth. Child screams. Parent says, okay, you don't have to brush your teeth. Takes the brush away. And then the child settles down, terminates the problem behavior. So, so what, we're, what, what I'm going to show you is some data on the first two steps, these first two, then the next three, and finally all four. So it's a, it's a, it's a sort of stepwise analysis of, of this change. So this is a coercive process. This is a constructive process. This is baseline, and this is intervention. This is the mean number of times. This is called joint frequency. The mean number of times a two-step course of process happened in, in baseline, and the mean number of times a two-step course of process happened in intervention. And what I want to point out to you is this is the mean, that's the number to focus on, 135 times on the average. Is that a large number? It is. A hundred minutes of, of observation sampled across all base, sampled across baseline for a family. So it's ten observation sessions, ten minutes per observation session, a hundred minutes. That happened 135 times. Now in intervention it happened 16 times. Is that a reduction? Is that a small reduction? Is that a large reduction? It's a substantial reduction in the joint frequency of those first steps, demand, problem, behavior. You see, it, it fell really, it like fell off a cliff. That's a huge change in that joint frequency. Now, for third steps, demand, problem, behavior, withdraw, right? That's now. Now, let's look at the number of times those three steps occurred. In baseline, that happened 81 times on the average across the 10 families. In intervention, it fell down to 11 times. Is that a decrease? Is that a small decrease or a large decrease? I want you to interact with me because that will help you understand it. It's a pretty large decrease. I mean, just intuitively, you can see the numbers go down. It's, it's, a, it's like a ten, it's, a, it's an eight-fold decrease, isn't it? Or a ten-fold decrease. No, eight, it's an eight-fold decrease. So, so the demand, problem behavior, parent withdrawal of the demand went from happening a lot to happening just a bit. And finally, the full four steps happened 40 times during intervention on the average, down to seven times, about seven times during intervention. So again, you see this dramatic drop in the frequency, the joint frequency of this course of process. And the statistics show, this is a P, it means probability. The probability of this occurring is 0.005 for every step which means that the change from baseline intervention in regard to the course of process was statistically significant. This is a meaningful, durable change according to the rules of evidence of group design. Does, am I making sense? Does that make sense? But the question is, okay, the course of process dropped down to no, basically very low levels. But what happened? What replaced it? That's the, the real important question. The constructive process goes like this. So now we're going to look at the constructive process. Parent, child. Okay? So one, two, three, four. Parent demand, child compliance. Child does what the parent asks. Then the parent delivers positive attention. And then the child continues to do the task, right? Continues to behave appropriately. Those are the four steps of a constructive process in general, in situations, for example, where demands are common. So the first two steps are these. The first three steps are those. And this is the full four. And so now we're going to ask about that. So you can see in, in intervention, it's interesting. The two steps, parent demand followed by child compliance or parents busy followed by child you know, staying copacetic even though the parent's busy, that happened 94 times during baseline before we help them. That's a lot. And look at intervention. It just went up a little bit. Oh, I'm sorry. Uh, let me take that back. I was pointing to... I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go into reverse. Okay, we'll start that over again. Okay, 
Look at that, 94. And that jumped to 148. So it did go up. It did go up. However, that 0 0.10 means it wasn't a statistically significant change. So for the first steps, first two steps in this process, we could see that the difference between baseline intervention wasn't that different statistically. Although the numbers went up, chance could predict that, that increase. However, look at the third step. From 29 times, which is very low, in terms of three-step constructive process, demand, compliance, positive attention, to 67 times. Okay? So it's more, it more than doubled, and that is statistically significant. So what we see now is the parent at the third step is doing something to strengthen desired behavior instead of doing something to, 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 to reward problem behavior. And the fourth step happened only 15 times during baseline, but it jumped to 45 times, a threefold increase during intervention. And that is statistically significant. So the, the big picture here is what happened in baseline is the conditional structure of parent-child interaction supported problem behavior and ineffective parenting practices. That was the conditional structure. But now in intervention, the conditional structure of that interaction, meaning the basic core meaning of that interaction, has completely changed. It now supports child positive behavior and parent effective um, parenting practices. So what you have here is a, a empirical mathematical demonstration of the transformation of coercive processes into constructive processes and family routines with one little wrinkle. Because this is very interesting that we didn't get a statistically significant change at the first two steps, which means that the child, in terms of problem behavior, will continue to throw even though the child has made a huge change and the parent is doing a wonderful job now, the child will occasionally the child will occasionally deliver some problem behavior very very, very infrequently but you have, so you have to be vigilant about that but, but my main point though has to do with constructive process what this means this is a very promising notion that there the difference between baseline and intervention in terms of constructive process, the first two steps, is not that different, which means the child will occasionally comply. The child will keep it together while the parent's busy. But what's happening in baseline before intervention is that the parent isn't building on that. The parent isn't noticing that and reinforcing that. So it, in the midst of the problem, there's some hope here, right? The child will comply sometimes. The child will keep it together for a certain amount of time before they behave badly. It's just that the parent isn't reinforcing that. So now all the parent has to do is learn to reinforce that, and that will grow. And that's what we see at the third and fourth step. That gives one a lot of hope. And, and this actually gives some empirical um, foundation for that hope. That isn't all bad. There's hope here. We simply have to change what we do and notice more the things the child is doing well and, and, and really capitalize on, on those and build those. Does that make sense? Now, now, given this change, how does this affect family functioning? This is real interesting. What we have here is years one through, follow-up actually went to five, years five and six. This is baseline. This is intervention, and this is follow-up. Years 2 through 3.54 is intervention. This is follow-up. Now, this is a, a parenting stress index score, score, PSI score. This is a well-used measure in psychology. 333 is the average for mothers, and 310 was the average for fathers. Uh, that's the mean across 10 families for year 1. Oh, I'm sorry. This is the mean for seven families because, because we didn't have three families available to us and you have to have all the families to be able to do the analysis. You can't have like 10 here and seven there. We're only looking at seven families, the seven families who stuck with us 
we, that's, that's the best we could do with this measure because we, don't, we didn't have access to the other three families. What you see here is their stress level was incredibly high. Let me tell you what this means. The normative level of parenting stress for a kid's families raising typically developing kids is about 250, 260. Okay? If you're, if you're at the 99 percentile, meaning you have more stress than 99% of all families raising children, your score will be 299. Their score was 333, which means they have more stress, parenting stress, than 99.999% of families. They are maxed out with stress. And what happened across the course of the intervention? You'll see this changed very slowly. This is a very hard thing to change. But by, by follow-up, it had fallen to 283. Now, 283 is a normative level for families raising a child with autism. They're, they've recently done some norm, and they had a few hundred families, I think 100 families in one study, something like that in another study. And the average is about 285, for the, their parenting stress index score. So that's what we were able to achieve. But that is a modest achievement. Having said that, three or four parents entered the normative range or got real close. This is an average score. So this requires some humility. You see the fathers tracked the mother's scores pretty closely. So this is, this is a change that, 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 that has some meaning, but again, it would be nice if we got more change there. We also had a measure of family quality of life. And one is low and five is high. And we, family started out with the three. And you can see this also changed slowly. And we ended at 3.46 for mothers and 3.62 for fathers. It was higher during the last year of intervention, fell a little bit during follow-up when we weren't there with them for about a year or two. And so again, you see some improvement. But again, it would have been nice if it were more substantial. Now, statistically, what this shows, and I'll, I'll be real quick here, in terms of change in, in total parenting stress, that was a statistically significant change. So we can be happy for that. And the change in fa family quality of life rating across time, that was also a statistically significant change, 0.01 here, 0.001 here. So we did promote a statistically meaningful change. Whether that's a clinically meaningful change, it's a bit of a question. But I'll let one parent answer that question, because there'll be some video in a moment. And they'll give you their own point of view. Also, we wanted to know whether parent locus of control improved. And indeed, it did. I'll be very quick here. This is parent efficacy, parent responsibility, child control of parent life parent belief in fate or chance, and parent control of child behavior. Scores going down is good. And what you see here is child control of parent life. That went way down from the parent's point of view. Oh, I'm sorry. Parent, parental belief in fate or chance, that, became, that change was statistically significant, which means the parent less, in a, in a statistically significant way, did, no longer really believed that their parenting was con of their child was controlled by fate or chance. They believed that they had some control. They had some control over the destiny of their relationship with their child. In terms of parent control of child behavior, that also showed a statistically significant improvement, which means the parent will now say, unlike in baseline, I really do believe that I have some control over my child's behavior. Whereas before they said, well, I, I don't think I do. And here, the parent's sense of efficacy, this approach significance, anything below 0.05 is considered statistically significant. This is real close. So the parent's sense of parent, parent efficacy improved across the course of intervention. So that's interesting. Now, case study. This will actually be one family, because we don't have time for two. Uh, this, is the, this is a pseudonym. It's the Etienne family, um, a French-Canadian father. Child was four years old when the study started, nine years old um, at the end, nine year old, nine year old now. Uh, the child's high functioning, uh, verbal. The child has a good sense of humor, enjoys telling jokes now. The family, mother is American, father's Canadian. 
Mother is a tax clerk. Father was a na navigation officer when the study started. He is a, sh should I sit down? I'm in your way. That, that's better now. May I sit down? Um, the father is a businessman now. There also is an older sister. Uh, this boy engaged in a wide range of problem behaviors, including defiance, physical aggression, tantrums, physical resistance. And the behavior of great concern was food refusal. He basically f refused to eat almost anything. His diet was um, french fries, um, those little um, donuts, round donuts, what are they called? Tidbits. Tidbits, yeah, tidbits, thank you. Um, it was, and he drank milk from a bottle. He refused to drink milk from a cup. He was like a baby drinking from a bottle. The routines that the parent chose to, parents chose to work on was bedtime, drinking from a cup, dinner time, and restaurant. You'll see three routines dealing with meals because that was a huge concern of the family. So here's an example. Here's what basically the family faced for the bedtime routine. I don't want to go to bed. Don't want to. Don't want to go to bed. Wah. And the father replies. I want to go to bed. I want, I want, I want to. There, there, I know. These parents were really beside themselves because the child slept with them every night. And they would, this kid's now, you know, at the time we met, they were, he was four years old and they were getting pretty tired of this. They wanted to have their bed back. And if they tried to put him in his own bed, he'd just have a huge fit. And so they just gave up. So they weren't getting good sleep. They were basically having a lot of sleepless nights, and they were really, really tired. And so here's the data, and I'm going to have to orient you to this. This is the percentage of intervals of problem behavior. This is the percentage of steps completed in the routines. This is the bedtime routine. This is the drinking from cup routine. This is the dinner routine, and this is the restaurant routine. And what you see here, the open squares are steps completed and the black dots are problem behavior. This is baseline. This is initial training. And this is multi-component. This is maintenance support. And this is follow-up. follow me? And what you see here is notice how this is 0 to 100%. Notice how problem behavior is really high. You see that? Really high. And it's not getting better. It's stable. See that? It's not getting better. Let's just focus on the first routine, three routines. And then right after intervention, what happens? It drops down to zero. Drops down to near zero. Drops down to a low level. Right? A very low level. And that maintains. See that? See how it maintains? And then what happens if steps completed? It's really low, basically at zero. And what happens after intervention? It jumps up to 80 to 100 percent. Jumps up to 80 to, uh, here's 100 percent all the way along. Here it struggles to jump up. This is the real tough dinner routine. It was really tough to change this one. There's some regression here, but finally it comes back up. And so there's a change there of meaning and value. And then follow-up uh, follow occurs at 9 months and 12 months, meaning we go away, we come back at 9 months later, no help. We say, how's it going? Can we videotape? The parent says, go ahead. Come back at 12 months, one year later, no help. Can we videotape? And you can see the bedtime maintained, the cup drinking maintained, the dinner maintained, and the restaurant maintained. And just to let you see what that looks like,
So that was baseline. The family has given you permission to show this to you. Okay, so, no, we don't want to see it again. And now I'm going to leap to uh, follow up to save a little time. This is follow up. This is no help for about nine months and uh, this is what it looks like. This is just a few months ago. What would happen if you cross a chicken with a poodle? And the mother goes, what? Chicken will lay poodle eggs. The chicken will lay poodle eggs. So that's, that's basically follow-up. And you can see the father is providing a certain amount of support, but also eating his meal, and they're having an enjoyable meal. But don't take my word for it. Um, I have now some, in a moment I'll show you some video of the parents talking. But first, the sequential analysis results for this family. What we see here is the same diagram. The man, calm behavior, withdraw, reduce demand, reduce problem behavior or, accept, or the child returns to acceptable behavior. This is during baseline, escape driven course of process. You can see this happened 220 times, this first two steps. And then the third step happened 82 times, and the third, fourth step happened 39 times. And each one was statistically significant. These are conditional probabilities. 89% chance that that'll happen, very high. 39% chance that that would happen, pretty high. 19% chance that the full four steps would happen, but each one was statistically significant, which means that in baseline we definitely had a stable course of process operating. But did we have a um, constructive process operating in baseline? Absolutely not. Look at that. There was no four step constructed ho constructive process happening. There were only five times did the th three steps occur. Only t 12 times did that happen, the man followed by compliance.
So there's no constructive process going on in baseline. So what's happening in intervention? Do we see an escape-driven course of process in intervention? You tell me. Is there an escape-driven course of process occurring in intervention? Shireen. No, what, what gives you a clue? Relative frequency, right? Zero. No instance during 100 minutes of observation across 10 files, 10 observation sessions and intervention, do you see a four-step uh, course of process. You don't even see this, the, the third step. The parent doesn't withdraw or reduce her demand. And this occurred only four times. Now that, though, was viewed as statistically significant by the computer, but those two dots is a message from the computer, the analysis um, format of the computer that says, you don't have enough data to give a lot of credence to that analysis. There isn't enough data to really do the analysis. So that's suspect. But what you see here is the vanquishing of the course of process. It just doesn't exist now in, interven in, in intervention. But what does exist? Look at that. A robust constructive process has emerged. That happened 69 times, conditional prob probability 61%. 31 of those 69 times, the child parent delivered positive attention about half the time. And 27 of those times, almost every one of those 31 times, the child went back to just being engaged in the task. Each time, these, this relationship is statistically significant. So there you see the emergence of a robust constructive process. Now we also ask the parents, how, how, how acceptable is this change to you? How acceptable were the procedures to you? How acceptable were, were the goals for you? In seven measures from 2005 to 2010, including follow-up, the, parent the parents gave us an average rating of 4.9 out of 5, which is very high. We also asked, how good does this plan fit with your ecology, with your family's life? And across eight measures from 2005 to 2010, they gave us an a, a average of 4.8. So you can see it's the parents, the parents viewed the plan, its goals, procedures, outcomes as socially valid and a good fit. But here is their own words. This is the family talking about their experiences and perspectives on the intervention. Because we thought if we couldn't sleep, we couldn't tap on the food. 
tools worked, and uh, it was just a matter of training us to get us to follow through with things. And uh, it, once we did that, once we achieved the bedtime routine success, it was you know full steam ahead with the feeding. One of the things is um, the Lord started the intervention with the feeding. It was kept away from me because I was too emotionally attached. I'm too swayed by the screaming and that, and they were neutral. They knew what the job was, and any kind of um, behaviors Parker would exhibit and wouldn't affect them. And with it's your son, if he's you know upset or screaming, my natural instinct is to once again pull the demand away and comfort him. She told me from the beginning that we were going to make you know Parker's going to love vegetables and that, and I would, I honestly did not at the beginning did not believe her. Uh, I was a skeptic. And uh, I'm like sure, Lauren, sure, but you know if you start trusting, once you build that trust, you just go. And then once you start seeing successes and you buy into it, it's, you know, normal for Parker will be taking that out of the But he's got favorite foods. Um, he always laughs. We always laugh because his favorite foods are the vegetables. He loves his corn and peas and, and yeah, broccoli and awesome. green beans and mashed potatoes. <laughs> uh, we've seen a lot of changes in Parker's behavior over the past five years. I find he's a lot more relaxed. Uh, because there's no great mystery in, as far as how things are going to work as far as um, food that. Of course, he's well more nourished than he ever was before, so I, I believe that helps. And he's also developing into a you know very smart young boy. He's you know conversational. He's funny. He's developed his personality. So I think all of it's um, related to to how we started with the eating and moving forward. Yeah, he's not he's not withdrawn. Was a very, if you want to call it a, a word function, very um, personable. The way we work with Parker has affected all, it's gone across all parts of his life now. He's able to respond to teachers now. He's able to make friends. If a teacher asks him to do something, he'll do it now. He's, he's no longer trying to uh, control every situation in his life. Our work with Lauren has been amazing. Um, it's a relationship we've developed over many years now. She is very good at reading the situation and seeing what needs to be done. And within, I don't know how long it took, but within a few days of assessing Parker, she had us, she knew exactly what the problems were and how to attack them. And she was always able to talk to us and she respected us so much the whole time and didn't talk down to us. And, and um, she was and answer our questions in, a, in layman's terms, not, you know, and, and we were able to ask questions to her and not worry about it, you know, she would just answer. And she, and she was confident the whole way that it was going to be changed. What is our life like now? It's, it's uh, pretty much turned around. It's, we're able to do things. We've been able to go on a vacation. We can go out to dinner at a restaurant. We can actually do things as a family. It's right side up. Yeah, in fact, you know, Richard just recently took Parker to a Vancouver Giants game, which is something he could have only dreamed of yeah, yeah. five years ago. We just went to a hockey game. We could do it. Parker and I, we could just sit down and we could, we could talk about uh, he likes He has these uh, little uh, guys, and these go-go's, so he talks to me about his little go-go's. And uh, we talk at we each and every day, you know, whenever I go. He wants to explain, he wants to explain things to him. Dad now is the one that Yeah, he comes to me to
feel a lot more confident. So it makes it easier. I can have a life away from it. I can. I now feel I can go out with friends and leave Parker home with Richard and not have to worry that World War III is going to break up. You know, and, and if that's a huge thing. I'm not feeling like I have to be tied to the house. Uh, we have normalcy. We have we control. Have control. Yeah. We have peace. We have a, a happy family. We have the tools we need. And we have, yes, we definitely have the tools that we need to deal with situations. And they come up every, they come up, they do come up, but we don't feel powerless. So we are in the powerless and you cannot do anything. Well, we, we realize there's always going to be a constant struggle with Parker trying to regain control. It's a constant push and pull. And if we slip back at any point, he jumps in. And it's just, it's going to be there all the time. So every once in a while, you get a reminder. Yeah. Every once in a while, not very often. Not very often. But then you look back, okay, he had a real hard time. Why? Well, usually it's because of something we, it's usually something that we, we didn't prepare and we didn't show him what was going to happen or we didn't react the proper way. You know, we're human. We don't, we're not perfect. So there's little push and pull that goes along. But now we're able to go, okay, sit back and okay, we can change it the next time. And that's, and that's, the key is really the fact that you're not, you know, you can have a, a so-called failure where you maybe have done something wrong, and then it, but then you look back on it, and I know I do, uh, you know, Parker's had a hard time somewhere, it's like I can look back and say, hey, what didn't I do, what could I have done to change it, and make sure I don't do it again. I think the biggest picture was, like, as a whole, improving the whole family functionality. I think um, we now have a family core. We now can do things as a family. Um, you don't realize eating would uh, I mean, I would go to the eating because that was the biggest thing, but what, how one child's eating can affect so many things. And now we feel we can, we can work as a family unit. And I think just that alone, the fact that we know, you know, we're planning another trip, another vacation, things like that. We're, we're able to function. We, we, we have a family bond. So that's the family's perspective. In a brief discussion, I have about a minute or two left. Is that okay? May I take the last two minutes? So uh, in summary, um, the study has shown a statistically significant improvement in child behavior and routine steps completed across 10 families, a quite significant change. Uh, nine of the 10 families showed the, a transformation of course of processes and the constructive processes in the target family routines. Also, there was a statistically significant improvement in parenting stress, family quality of life, parent locus of control. Nine of 10 families viewed the approach as acceptable and important. Now, four of 10 families actually experienced a level of change that may cons be considered transformational. Um, this was one of the families. They, their life just turned around almost completely. And the, the factors associated with change in the routines were a really good support plan, this is across all the families, because all the families experience change, but only four experience transformational change. So the factors associated, associated with change in the routines was good, technical, good, good support plan, really good uh, collaborative partnership with the interventionist, the, the use of family-centered supports as needed, good coordination with other service providers in a lifespan perspective, meaning we're looking at their whole life across a number of years, not just for a few months. But there were some factors in addition that were associated with transformational change, and here they are. The key, in my mind, was a partnership between the mother and father. Those four families that experienced transformational change, there was a really strong partnership between the mother and father. The father was an active and full participant and fully supported what the mother was doing. Those were key, and also interventionist tenacity. For those fa four families that experienced transformational change, the interventionist did not give up on the family, continued to work really hard at promoting the change, even though, even when there were setbacks, even when the family was experiencing like, whoa, this is too scary, they would, they would still be there for the family and, 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 and patiently um, wait if necessary or push ahead when appropriate. And so there's two points to tenacity. They, the, the interventionist went to parents' pace. Some parents' pace was very slow, very slow where it took years to promote the change. But the interventionist never gave up and never got impatient, just went the parent's pace. 
because the parent knew how fast they could go. And it wasn't in weeks, it wasn't in months. For some families, it was in years. But it was that pace that we followed that allowed them to reach that level of transformational change. And also unwavering encouragement. Um, so those were the keys for transformational change. Thank you. I'm happy to stay for questions, but you're happy to go. You're welcome to go too. Thank you for coming.